All right, welcome back to the North Carolina Real Estate Show. I'm Tiffany Weber, your host, and today I am joined by an attorney with me at Thomas and Weber, Aaron Weatherman. Hi. Nice to see you. I am resisting every urge in my being to do that fake um, rap like call out that I (laughs) so her the weatherman (laughs) and because your initials are EW the weatherman ew (laughs) today I'm very excited that you're here with me today to talk about the North Carolina offer to purchase in fact I recorded this episode in June and then in July the whole contract changed (laughs) Yep. <laughs> or at least a significant enough portions of the contract change that I had to scrap the episode. So we are basing this discussion off of the July 2022 standard offer to purchase and contract that's standard form 2T, some people know it by. And this episode, it's we're not going to get it all done in one episode. This thing is yeah. 16 pages. <laughs> but we're going to focus on the terms and definitions, so sections 1, 2, and 3. If we get further, great, but that is kind of what we're hoping to accomplish in this episode for those agents that are listening and following along. Do you want to kick us off? Let's start talking about some of those defined terms on the first page. So some of those first terms are the seller, the buyer. Really, I like the first page is your parties, your price, and um, your property. And so those are really the terms that are defined. Who are your parties? What are those purchase price and terms? And what is that property? Yeah. And there's a change here on the first page from the last version. The property, you're given a lot of different ways to describe it. That way, if you happen to make a mistake on one thing, you've got a couple different ways to try to (laughs) figure out what exactly is being bought here. And there's a new part that's added from the prior version that says the property will or will not include a manufactured or mobile home. And if there's a manufactured home included, there's kind of a note here to the agent that, hey, your contract is not complete unless you include that addendum with this offer. So that's standard form 2A11T, the additional provisions addendum. And it's got some special things in there to address if you're including a manufactured home with the contract. So you know, parties, property, purchase price. I love that. The triple P's. Now, one thing I wanted to point out here in the due diligence fee and earnest money deposit, there was a a little change made from the prior version that said, you know, by initial earnest money deposit made payable to escrow agent. Now it says and delivered to. So, you know, you can imagine why this, that change was made. You've got some buyer out there (laughs) that's like, But I made it payable to the escrow agent. I just kept it in my (laughs) pocketbook. I mean, I did what the contract said. (laughs) So this is making it abundantly clear, keeping the check in your pocketbook, which, you know, you're from the South when you say pocketbook. (laughs) This is from a fellow Southerner. So that is not judgment. That is recognizing. (laughs) That's a very Southern thing to say. Let's talk about how you break down the purchase price here. Your top line is the total amount. Yeah. And then you start deducting things. So talk a little bit about like the different ways that your purchase price can be made up. So the first deduction you can make is that due diligence fee. You know, I recently went under contract for a home and as part of my contract, when we made an offer to purchase, our agent sent us this form and in big, bold letters, she said, non-refundable, you're not getting it back. (laughs) And so that's your due diligence fee. You're not getting it back. It's non-refundable. Then your earnest money deposit. So that's the money that's going to be held by your escrow agent, who is really usually your attorney, your closing Mm -hmm. attorney. And so that's made payable and delivered to your (laughs) escrow agent. (laughs) And then any additional additional earnest money deposit and whether there's any seller financing, that's where you would put that in that mm-hmm. section. And then at the end, how much is due after you deduct those due diligence and earnest money deposits. And one thing that I see people that don't read that last thing in the balance, yeah. they'll say, balance of the purchase price paid in cash at settlement. Well, they need to keep reading because it says some or all of which may be paid with the proceeds of a new loan. Like yep. you might have a seller, it's like, Well, it said they'd pay me in cash. (laughs) Well, that balance can, you know, cash doesn't mean dollar bills. (laughs) It means 
U.S. dollars, yes. essentially, but yes. not dollar bills being slid across the table. <laughs> <laughs> I wish I could say that no one had ever brought a briefcase to closing, but that's unfortunately not true. It, in fact, it happened twice in one week. I'm like, what is my life? <laughs> You know, like the all of the instructions are pretty clear. Yeah, yeah. You you can't bring a suitcase of dollar bills to the closing table yet. These I had two buyers within one week do that. On the next page, this is an interesting. At the top of page two, this is talking about what happens if the buyer doesn't deliver those due diligence fee or earnest money deposits by the due dates, and In North Carolina, this contract, I don't want to say it's um, skewed towards the buyer. The buying process is skewed towards the buyer because once the buyer decides to buy the property, the seller can't just say no. Yeah. The seller's stuck selling the property to the buyer unless the buyer decides they don't want to buy it anymore. Yeah. So in that way, in that sense, the, the process is skewed towards the buyer, but here is a way that you know, one of the few termination rights that the seller has under the contract is if the buyer does not deliver the due diligence fee or initial EMD by the due dates yep. or if the check checks bounce. Yep. So the seller's got to give notice. And then within one banking day after that, if they still haven't complied, then seller has the right to terminate. Yep. And not only that, they get the due diligence fee and the earnest money deposit, <laughs> yep. uh, which is usually refundable. Yep. And... They can get attorney's fees if the buyer doesn't hand it over. So that is an interesting departure from what most people consider to be a very buyer-friendly yeah. contract. Absolutely. Now, let's talk a little bit about, go through, like, what does the earnest money deposit mean? What does escrow agent mean? Take us through um, the definitions in E, F, and G. So... I said that due diligence was non-refundable. Earnest money deposit is refundable to a point. Really, it's once you hit the end of that due diligence period. After that point, it's non-refundable unless the seller is in breach. Um, If there's some sort of title defect, then you can get your money back. But otherwise, you're probably not going to get that EMD back. That escrow agent, that's us. Um, Please, let it be us. (laughs) If you're around Lake Norman, we'd love... To be your escrow agent. Um, But otherwise, if it's not us, it is your closing attorney. That is the person who is handling the closing and is holding that EMD check. And it can be your realtor's firm if they have an escrow account set up. Most of the time, the the agencies and the firms don't want to deal with it. So it's it's very simple for the closing attorney to be the escrow agent. Now, I want to talk a little bit about There's a special note in the contract that talks about what happens if the buyer and seller dispute the earnest money deposit. And this is when, you know, generally speaking, if you come to Thomas and Weber and you're the buyer, we represent the buyer. Unless we're specifically representing the seller, the buyer has a different attorney. This is when we, as the buyer's attorney, may be forced to step back and say, we have to be out of this now. We have to, you know... We're no longer in the mix. Buyer, you're going to have to go retain separate counsel. Seller, you're going to have your own counsel. If they disagree about the earnest money deposit, then we kind of have to be completely removed from the process so that they can figure out who's entitled to that earnest money deposit. We keep it in our account until we have something in writing from the parties or an order from a judge. Or in this case, then the clerk of court. Um, the clerk of court would decide in a special proceeding. Yeah. And I think that's something that gets confusing Yeah, for a lot of buyers because they'll say, okay, well, I'm terminating before the expiration of due diligence. The contract says I'm entitled to a return of my earnest money. And the seller is disputing that for some reason. It doesn't matter whether their reason to dispute is good or bad. <laughs> if they dispute it, yeah, the money's frozen yeah. until they either agree in writing or... Or we have to pay the money to the clerk and the parties go figure it out. So sorry to digress there. I will let you get back to it. (laughs) Of course. That was an important point. So I'm glad you pointed it out. Um, So after that, we have the effective date. That date's super important. Uh, The number of times I've had people pull out contracts that have not been signed by all parties. 
But that's <laughs> that's the kicker. Um, so the effective date is really once the contract is fully executed by all parties. So that's when your buyer sends in the offer, they initial every page, they sign that last page, you give it over to the sellers and the sellers do the exact same thing with no changes. Um, if the sellers make changes, we're going to do it all over again. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. After that, H is due diligence. So that's what I told you is that non-refundable money. You're not getting it back. That's a thank you for holding the house for me deposit. No, that's the due diligence fee. Oh, yes. yes. So Aaron basically just skipped ahead to I. <laughs> <laughs> so the fee is in exchange for getting the right to conduct the due diligence in section H, which is basically I'm checking out the property you get the right to go through and figure out whether you actually want to buy it. That's why you got to negotiate a, a long enough time in the yes. contract because if you only give yourself one day to conduct due diligence, I hope that you have um, some inspectors, surveyors, lenders, everyone on speed dial that they all owe you a bunch of favors <laughs> and they're willing to get it done in less than a day yeah. you know because you're kind of at the mercy of your service providers here you know you can't get good information on whether it's a good property if you don't engage all of those service providers if you don't give them enough time to do their jobs <laughs> then you're going to be in a bad spot so not to put you on the spot um but a little bit um <laughs> so what if you don't have any earnest money deposit money down and so you put down your due diligence money. What what does it matter about how long the due diligence period is? Well, that's a good point. So it it's kind of similar to if there's no due diligence fee and it's only earnest money. Um, well, more so the scenario you described. But if you don't have both deposits, then these things kind of are malleable. So in the scenario you describe, if there is no earnest money deposit, so the money's gone no matter what. Yeah. The buyer always has the right to back out of the contract. The question is, are they going to lose more money for doing so? So if there's no earnest money, then, I mean, just get your inspections done before closing. Yeah. So the, the due diligence period, then it could run basically to the closing date. It could be, you know, a, that's one instance where it could be, you know, a day from. But <laughs> the shortest answer to the question that you asked is that if there is no earnest money deposit, the due diligence date doesn't matter as much because you're not losing any more money than yeah. you've already lost. Uh, now, I want to talk a little bit about the next three definitions. So settlement, settlement date, and closing. Settlement and closing are often used interchangeably, but they are different. Yep. So settlement is essentially what happens when you come to our office. Yep. So it's the delivery of all of the documents. So that's deed, settlement statement, deed of trust, loan docs, and then sending your money. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> Please don't forget. <laughs> yeah. So buyer's money and lender's money. And the settlement date is the date that you do all of those things. Yes. But the closing is more than that. So this is, this is where people get tripped up because, you know, they say, I'm coming to my closing at 10 a.m. And they walk out thinking, you know, well, we, we explain <laughs> to them they're not done. But they walk in thinking when they're done signing, they're going to be done and they own the property. Yeah. So closing, and I'm going to read a little bit here because this is important. This is the completion of the legal process. That's when title to the property is transferred from seller to buyer and it has a lot more steps than just the signing of the paperwork. It does include those things, but it is not a, only those things. So the first step is the settlement included in that definition above. Yeah. The second is a title update. So part of the closing includes a title search uh, to make sure clear title can be delivered. That search is done earlier in the process. So if any time elapses, that means hours um, a day, uh, yeah. two weeks, whatever it is. If any time elapses between the time the title search is done, which has to be done early in the process, mm -hmm. because I know I can hear some agent or a buyer saying, well, why don't you just do the title search last? That catastrophe. I mean, how do you get judgments <laughs> clear? <laughs> how do you figure out what to do with liens? Like you have to do the title search first yeah. and foremost. Absolutely. So that satisfactory title update means not just that we searched it, it means that we've searched and there's no negative findings. Yeah. So no new judgments, no new liens, no new bankruptcies, no new anything like that. So that is the second step. The third is that we've gotten authorization to disperse all the funds. 
So not just getting the buyer's funds, but also getting the lender's funds and the lender's permission to disperse the funds. It's yep. so another thing that people um, often forget is, well, the lender said they sent the money. Yes, they did, but they have not given funding approval. So that is something that is, you know, they want to see that you actually signed everything and you yeah. didn't sign Mickey Mouse. So <laughs> that's going to be important. <laughs> They're not going to yeah. get funding approval without that. And then recording of all of the recording documents. So deed, deed of trust, anything else that has to go um, to go along with re- the recorded documents. Now, if the title update gives bad information or we find out something bad happened, then the closing attorneys got to stop. Yep. And we got to stop and figure out what to do. We got to figure out how to satisfy um, whatever those issues are that need to be resolved. And the settlement is going to be delayed. Now, we will not get to the delay and settlement closing paragraph in this episode. Zero chance. <laughs> <laughs> but... Um, that this is when that paragraph would be triggered. There's yep. other reasons too, but this is one of those things. And then just to close out the the definition section is special assessment. It's basically like an HOA or the taxing authority levying saying like, okay, we're going to charge all the owners on this road some special assessment so that we can repave the road. Yeah. yeah. That's something like that. And the seller has to disclose that. All right, so Erin, will you talk to us about fixtures? Oh, fixtures, my favorite thing. I did a whole (laughs) video on it. Uh, You can go check that one out. Um, So fixtures are really the stuff that's attached to the house. I I liked the saying of if you could flip the house upside down and shake it real hard, what falls out? Not a fixture. Anything (laughs) that stays, that's a fixture. I like that. That's good. (laughs) I did too. Um, So that would be things like your stove, possibly certain chandeliers, just things that are attached into that house. And so section two about fixtures really explains what is a fixture. um, And it calls out specific examples of what a fixture is. Then it talks about anything that is a fixture, but the seller doesn't own it. And so that would be satellite dishes or anything like that. Mm -hmm. Fuel tanks used to be included in this section. Now they have their own special section in this new version. (laughs) Uh, But that's a good example of it's a fixture, but it's not owned. And then also any fixtures that the parties have agreed won't stay. Yep. I think this is... um, I've always found the deleting data from devices part interesting because at closing, I'm sure you've heard this. Did you wipe the Nest Cam or the Ring camera? Um, Have you logged out of everything? You know, Mm -hmm. that's not just something that the buyer should be asking the seller. It is a contractual obligation of the seller. So the seller has to unpair, delete all of their data from those smart devices, uh, restore it to factory settings. That gives the assurance to the buyer that, no, the seller is not watching us move in <laughs> <laughs> through the ring doorbell. <laughs> Go ahead and talk about number three as well. So that's where you put anything that's personal property that you want to convey with the property. So refrigerators, not a fixture. Those one of those things that if I shook that house, it would fall out. Mm-hmm. Um, and so if you want the refrigerator you better put the refrigerator. (laughs) And if you want that specific refrigerator that you saw, you better call out that specific refrigerator. You beat Um, me to the punch there. (laughs) We know lawyer things. (laughs) Um, So after that, the other stuff would be like um, washers and dryers. Those are typically normaler things. But this is also where if you really like that seller's table, (laughs) yes, you put your seller's table. Yep. Mirrors are common too because sometimes mirrors are custom made to fit the space so like all right well it's not going to fit in the seller's new house they don't want it and and the buyer really wants it because they don't want to have to go get some special thing made for the the space so the other one i really like is bar stools you never realize how specific your bar height is until you put a stool there and like if that stool already looks good, I'll just take it. Thank yeah. you. <laughs> yeah. I mean, you're going to want to redecorate your house yes. anyway on your new house. So let me just have what you got here. It looks great. You did a great job. Like butter the sellers up a little bit and say, you have such wonderful taste. Uh, <laughs> so I feel like that is a good place to stop for this episode. So we will continue on in our next episode talking about we'll just continue on talking about the rest of the contract. This thing is so long and so detailed. 
it's so important for agents to know what's in here. Don't give your clients legal advice. What we're telling you is understand the legal concepts in the document. It will make you better at your job. It will make you more confident with your clients because yeah. if your clients are trying to say something crazy, you're like, that's not going to work. Yeah. Uh, and if, if they don't believe you, you know, get them to the closing attorney and the yep. closing attorney will back you up on the things <laughs> yeah. that is provided you're correct. That's why it's important to know what's in here. Yeah. Um, so that you're not, you know, accidentally stepping in something or, you know, giving advice on something that is way off base. Thankfully we work with a lot of good agents. We don't yeah. personally, you know, you guys are great. Whatever you do in Lake Norman, all y'all agents need to come to Lake Norman and deal with the, <laughs> the agents that we work with because <laughs> they're great. Uh, but this is intended just to help you understand more of what does the contract actually say? Yeah. Not what you think it says, but or what you remember it saying in a prior version. What does this current contract actually say? So we will continue that process in our next episode. But for now, thank you for listening to the North Carolina Real Estate Show. See you in the next one. <laughs>